Et je vais vous présenter Nanor Kebranian. En fait, c'est euh, la communication de Nanor Kebranian que Rafi va nous lire, donc en anglais. Nanor Kebranian est professeur d'arménien à l'Université ah, de Colombia. Elle a envoyé son texte, donc euh, il porte sur genocide and criticism. Et voilà, merci à Rafi d'avoir accepté de, de le lire. Donc Nanor Kebranian, professeur à Colombia et spécialiste entre autres de Agop Oshagan. Okay, genocide, genocide. Non, non, je voulais dire, donc bien entendu, pour la prose, il faut patienter. Alors, uh, genocide and criticism. Alors, le texte est en, est en anglais. Presentation. Genocide is a crime of communal significance. A crime not only directed against an antagonistically differentiated community, but also against the very possibility of communality. One can trace this constitutive feature to Raphael Lep Lemkin's special emphasis on culture in his earliest conception of the crime. In 1933, he proposed a set of five offenses he considered instrumental to defining acts of ex extermination directed against ethnic, religious, or social collectivities, whatever the motive. He identified the first two of these offenses as acts of barbarity, and acts of vandalism. Acts of barbarity he described as an attack intended not only to harm an individual, but also to cause damage to the collectivity to which the la latter belongs. And he described vandalism as an extension of such violence, defining it as a form of systematic and organized destruction of the art and cultural heritage in which the unique genius and achievement of a collectivity are revealed in fields of science, arts, and literature. A decade later, Lemkin maintained the same emphasis in his book, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, at a time when he was also simultaneously and unsuccessfully striving to ensure cultur cultural destruction's inclusion as a punishable offense in what eventually became the United Nations Convention on the Prevention of Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. As genocide scholar A. Dirk Moses indicates, Lemkin went so far in this effort as to urge the Nuremberg prosecutors to amend their indictment of Nazi leaders to include genocide on the basis that the defendants aimed to destroy, cripple, or degrade entire nations, racial, and religious groups. The terms mass murder and extermination were insufficient, he stated, because they fail to convey the elements of selection and, not, and do not indicate the, lo the losses in terms of culture represented by the nation's victims. Why, inquires Moses, was culture so central to Lemkin's conception of genocide? The answer, as he demonstrates, lies in Lemkin's influences from functional anthropology. Drawing on the works of Sir James Fraser and Bronislaw Malinowski, Lemkin perceived culture, which he also called derived needs or cultural imperatives, as communalizing functions that were existentially necessary both for the group and, as importantly, for the fulfillment of individual group members' basic needs. He wrote that these needs find expression in social institutions or, to use an anthropological term, the culture ethos. If the culture of a group is violently undermined, the group itself disintegrates and its members must either become absorbed in other cultures, which is a wasteful and painful process, or succumb to personal disorganization and perhaps physical destruction. For that reason, and as Moses underlines, Lemkin concluded that the destruction of cultural symbols is genocide, and that destroying their function menaces the existence of the social group which exists by virtue of its common culture. What makes genocide in Lemkin's terms a unique kind of crime, then, is not the assault on collective biological life, nor even the destruction of cultural works per se, but rather the destruction of cultural artifacts and symbols as functional, 
that is, as communalizing devices, with their targeted destruction being indicative of the perpetrator's intention to eliminate the very possibility of being in community. As for what it means to be in community, Lemkin evidently subscribes to a fairly straightforward interpretation, namely a group of people tied by shared religious, ethnic, national, and or linguistic traditions. And, moreover, given his primary motivations and objectives, namely to punish and prevent crimes of annihilation, annihilation committed against groups as such, he upholds the unquestioned existential necessity of communality as that which lends integrity and significance to both the group and the individual. Lemkin would thus insist that in order to be and to become as a social being, one must have recourse to and indeed participate in one's community, and that the community itself has an inalienable right, a legal one endorsed by genocide law to exist. But what precisely is a community? Italian political philosopher Roberto Esposito claims it is nothing. He demonstrates that community's Latin origin, communitas, radically contests political philosophy's conceptions of community as a wider subjectivity, a property belonging to subjects that join them together, a comuna. An attribute, a definition, a predicate that qualifies them as belonging to the same totality, insieme. That's the first meaning. No, that's th th those were the two, two, two meanings. Esposito identifies misplaced meanings in these assumptions by explaining that in all neo-Latin languages, common, commun, 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 is what is not proper, proprio, that begins where what is proper ends. It is what belongs to more than one, to many, or, or to everyone, and therefore is that which is public in opposition to private. Properly speaking, then, the etymology of community, consisting primarily of common, points to what cannot be one's own, property, but rather that which exists publicly, a shared something beyond the limits of oneself. Esposito's further findings suggest that this shared something is in fact no thing at all. He identifies this absence in another of Camunitas' origins, the word munus, which he asserts oscillates among three terms related to the idea of obligation, onus, officium, and donum, the last of which is donum, meaning gift, connotes obligation, insofar as it is a gift distinguished by its obligatory character. This allows him to propose that instead of property, what is shared by a community is captured by communis, whose ancient and presumably originary meaning had to be he who shares an office, a burden, a task, thereby revealing the basis of communitas as collective coexistence and participation, to be a conglomeration of unreciprocated obligations and debts, and not mutually held property. Communitas revealed thus to be a relationship of mutual obligations and debts can now be shown to hide an important ontological effect. Esposito observes that it expropriates the subject of a community of their initial property, in part or completely, of the most proper property, namely their subjectivity, so, so that members are no longer identical with themselves but are constitutively exposed to a propensity that forces them to open their individual boundaries in order to appear as what is outside themselves. Consequently, if the subject of community is no longer the same, it will by necessity be another, not another subject, but a chain of alterations that cannot even be fixed in a new identity. If the community allows always consists of others and never of itself, this suggests that its presence is constitutively inhabited by an absence of subjectivity, of identity, of property. 
it intimates that it is not a thing, or rather, it is a thing defined precisely, precisely by its non, a non-thing. Rather, community is a relation wherein individuals meet in a point of contact that brings them into relation with others to the degree to which it separates them from themselves. In this threatening ontological outcome of continuous separations, partitioning, and departures, individuals move away from their own subjectivities and toward that which doesn't belong to us and can never belong to us. No longer a locus, a possibility, or a promise of collective and participatory integra integration, and utterly incapable of producing effects of commonality, of association, and of communion, community then appears to consist of intrinsic voids and constitutive separations that result in constant loss. That of losing, along with our individuality, the borders that guarantee its inviolability with respect to the other. Communal belonging requires, therefore, that members resign from themselves to a perpetual state of potential violence, one that consists especially of a self-dissolution or assimilation into an endless other, into the void of a perennial alterity, an externality, a no-thing with no end. May this not be the worst of all dispersions, a, not a net loss to an unnameable outside that is the voiding of oneself? Does all this not sound very much like the effects attributed throughout countless studies doubtless familiar to nearly all of us here in, in attendance to the Armenian experience of genocide and dispersion? Is genocide then merely what renders visible the true nature of community and communality as perpetual dis divisibility? Is there a qualitative difference or merely one of degree in the kinds of phenomenological ruptures experienced by the community that was and the community that remained after the ordeal? Or perhaps, was the genocide not an opportunity finally, definitively, to create a community, unified and held together by a system of debts and obligations, where one, a single one, at least had not existed prior? Intimations of these possibilities have arisen in recent scholarship on Ottoman Armenians, especially in the works of Vahetashtian. Writing on the Armenians of Cilicia at the turn of the 20th century, Tashjan discusses the frustrations experienced by Armenian Revolutionary Federation delegates and clerics attending to the region in their interactions with apparently and incorrigibly wayward Ottomanized Armenians. Having been dispatched precisely to tend to the community in order to facilitate its integration into the normative modes of Armenianness conceived by members of the political, religious, and intellectual elite, what they confronted were the limits of their intended projects of homogenization. In contrast to such pre-genocide efforts, post-genocide homogenizing programs were, on the whole, a resounding success. Tashjan has demonstrated how, immediately following the genocide, institutional initiatives employed a wholesale pedagogy of sameness to regroup, purify, reintegrate genocide survivors into a nationalized community. National organizations mobilized aggressively to purge all entrenched traces of Ottoman cultural practices, from language and music to customs and dress, in an effort to create the new Armenian. This mobilization has been and continues to be extremely successful. Hence, Khachik Tololian's claim, writing nearly a century later, 1996, that his diasporic upbringing necessitated communal belonging through loyalty and sacrifice. Concurring with Tololian, Martin Hovanesian also concludes that, for more than half a century, Armenians have thought of diaspora as a conservationist center with a communitarian myth of decentered belonging. But in Krikor Belidian's extensive critical writings, 
consisting of over six volumes and countless essays, articles, reviews, and commentaries, read together another past, another possibility, another reality, I should perhaps say another otherness, an otherness emerges. One derived from a series of subtle, he might say yerktimi, readings of, an, or entertsumner to use his word, that both directly and indirectly engage the question of community, and that, moreover, produce a critique of community. One may easily interpret his first volume of readings, Dram, 1980, as a critical departure from community. In an interview with Vehanush Tekian, he explained, Pardon me, because uh, I why beyond the traditional avantaganen antin? Because he states, avantutun gochvaze ainche vor yurahaduge miain mezi. Negadi chunim panav hayatiutun hayaganutun gochvaz zerzumnera. Voronk gukan iskagan askainamolutenem. Merjo avurte antatar senadze tursen. Kitsadze haraperutian mechmetnel tursinhet. Urishinhet, Odarinhet. Misht stazadze terevesal devadze chemkider, pats misht stazadze yevadov harastazadz. Yete ais gabe tursinhet ankidagits orenkmene, aden nevor tarzenenk zain kidagits ganon, ansnink menkal mergarkin odarutenen modenalu hamar mezi dervadzin. Betke nach tursiel lenk dunen, abrink tersutian merige, yev hedo terevasait tsevov matnenk dun, yete avantutune genegadek dun. Pites avantutune dunce, ail miain seme, semme tebi havanagan dunma, ur penav bidice penagink. Avantutune mesme guzevor a lank misht sem. A lank misht antin, yev aina denevor gusterzeng anor ganona. These lines effectively make a call to decommunalize by rendering tradition the very basis of community, that which requires obligations and debts for its continued existence, foreign. Or to put it, to put it differently, Validian's statement puts forth the possibility of rendering oneself foreign to this tradition, in part by locating the supposedly foreign within the tradition itself. Amenen garevora ailene, he states in the same interview, anor ailutyuna, anor tersutyuna, vorun entertsume harge hantibi. Vorun entertsume harge hantibi, okay. Menk tshpaktapar shat gesirenk magagil, nuinutian tashterun vara, Gitsaktink a lal i prevte tapansik iraru. Barzabes vorov edev hayereng. Amenankam vor nor kord megahait nevi. Kennatad miaganin gahait darare. Asigatur sene mereche. Menk ais peschenk. Indra inknutian vavera ganoren. Intra. Indra nuinkan vavera ganoren merene vor kansiamanto. Belidian's understanding of tradition as that which requires, and that has always already required, dispersion, directly contradicts the conventional understanding of community as, in Esposito's words, a wider subjectivity, a property belonging to subjects that join them together. An attribute, a definition, a predicate that qualifies them as belonging to the same totality. 
And it is in understanding that seems to spur virtually, and it is in an understanding that seems to spur virtually the entire corpus of his critical output, but, bes but especially his analyses of Western Armenian literature in Dram, Mard, and Saint-Quentin de littérature arménienne en France, as well as in the long essay, L'expérience de la catastrophe dans la littérature arménienne. Almost everything these volumes encapsulate has been written with the problem of community in mind. One could easily assert that the very writers and texts Belidian selects for his readings underline his concern. Indra in Dram and Yerya Demirjibashan in Mard, for example, furnish him with the material to analyze the possibilities of subjectivity and individuation by writers who were otherwise confined to the collectivizing conventions imposed by the hyper-communalized, communalizing millet system. His extensive writings on both Hagopo Shagan's literary and critical works in Mard offers some of the most penetrating insights into the pitfalls of being in community. Hagopo Shagan Yev Aremadahai Noravebe, for example, draws on extremely important and unprecedented link between the political vicissitudes of Ottoman subjecthood and the otherwise unnoticed and unquestioned shortcomings of the Western Armenian realist short story. But the problem of community really becomes a central issue in Bilodian's discussions of catastrophe in Armenian literature, specifically in those works produced by the writers belonging to the short-lived Paris-based movement, Menk, of the early 1930s. It would be fair to say that he devotes a disproportionately great amount of thought and analysis to this particular group, as evinced not only through the extensive chapters in Saint-Quentin de littérature arménienne en France, but also in the numerous essays dealing with the various works of Migoros Sarafian, Shan Shahnur, and Zareh Vorpuni, among others in Dram, Mard, and the essay L'Experience de la Catastrophe dans la littérature arménienne. In none of these discussions does Belidian ever use the term genocide to refer to the dual plight of survival and exile common to these writers and their subject matter. His term of choice is catastrophe, which he goes to great pains to elucidate in his essay L'Experience de la Catastrophe. But without ever conclusively defining it, and I'm quoting, despite the absence of a firm definition, the set of texts Bolivian selects, the questions he poses, and the effects he traces reveal catastrophe to be that which threatens, undermines, and dissolves the possibility of communality. Au seuil de la catastrophe, he writes, les frontières du réel et de l'irréel s'effacent probablement pour la bonne raison que la catastrophe emporte en les niant toute limite, toute référence, toute valeur et tout sens. Vient ensuite le sentiment de l'étrangéité, de l'incommunication. Working through these writers' novels, he goes on to observe that the catastrophe is that which leaves no trace of a law, where everything begins to resemble everything else where differences, specificities, and limits no longer exist, such that everything becomes permissible to the survivor. According to these writers, Belidian also observes, the catastrophe is what produces and results in the impossibility of being in community, that forces individuals apart, that reinforces their divergent characters, and that sunders excuse me, the chains of transmission and filiation. Perhaps more than any other feature, it is a set of recurring themes that provoke such an interpretation of catastrophe. Belidian lists them as consisting of orphanhood, foreignness, hostility toward the foreign world, self-destructiveness, the dispersion of the family, violence within the group, threats against the group, fear of possible disintegration, sterility, absence of descendants, language loss, etc. In short, everything associated with being without or outside community. And yet, without questioning, undermining, or overwriting the legitimacy of these concerns, Belidian, 
also suggests, in the sub subtlest terms, that catastrophic decommunalization also paradoxically presents unprecedented prospects of collective self-realization. -realis he writes, Parler, écrire, penser ne sont pas des actes secondaires, dérive, 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 indépendant de l'expérience de la catastrophe elle-même. Ils sont partie intégrante de cette expérience, pour ne pas dire qu'ils sont cette expérience même. The incomplete experience of catastrophe, he states, renders discourse possible. And as he himself elucidates throughout his analyses, especially of the Menk writers, this discourse does not, this does nothing other than to proceed avantagane antim, beyond tradition, to conceive and engage with otherness, that which comes from the outside and cannot be entirely reconciled with oneself. If catastrophe menaces community, then it also proves to be the basis of a more complete subjectivity. Thank you. <laughs>